Hello. Welcome. It's take number 36, I think, on this lecture. So enjoy. I'm, I, it's either very polished or totally nonsense by now. So up to you to decide. But uh, what we're going to talk about today is a kind of machine learning pipeline issue, something about how machine learning gets done more than we're talking about the algorithms. So we're interested in how we can use limited data to get a better idea of how an algorithm is going to perform when it tries to generalize to new examples of that data. So that's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and magic is buzzing around as you saw him a minute ago. Maybe you can hear the kindergarten in the background on Zoom. So uh, my apologies for the nature of this one. Let's get on with it. Um, so first, just a little bit of logistics. Homework one, as you know, is out now. And you have until just as midnight happens, turning from the 15th of October into the 16th of October, that is the deadline. In the meantime, in between now and then, there's going to be discussion sections where you can ask about homeworks if you have an issue. You can, of course, tag me or one of the TAs in office hours. And you can, of course, ask questions on Piazza. You're allowed to, you know, uh, come send an email. So if you are struggling, please reach out. There's lots of venues for you. Um, and I have heard through the grapevine that a number of people are struggling with the math. So that's good in a way, right? Because obviously this is a course which is a step up maybe in the math end of things in the formal. So that's okay, we expect. Also, it's good in the sense that you're not alone, okay? So don't sit there struggling going, oh, it's just me, I've got to tough this out and figure it out myself. You are not alone, it's not shameful. Just reach out, let's figure this out together. And along those lines, if you are having some trouble especially, please do the reading. Those, those uh, sections we've assigned out of the Chris Bishop book are to help you learn. And some of the questions I've seen on Piazza make it kind of clear that at least those people were not doing the reading, okay? So I, I just want to make sure that that's out there, that it's not just kind of a suggestion. The Bishop book, the other resources that we've put out there, the links in the syllabus for each week, they will all help you absorb the material. So especially if you're struggling, please check out that stuff. Um, I've also heard a lot of chat about participation points, direct questions, and just people discussing it in various venues. I, I want you all to stop worrying. Participation points is not a big deal. We are not um, some sort of boarding school, you know, like, these are the rules and you will do it right and we will get no points. No, I mean, I'm not here to enforce exactly how you're participating. The whole system is there to encourage you to engage with the material in a way which, you know, I think will help you learn. But you're an adult and I'm not about to be policing like micro points. So really it's gonna be super easy points, people. If, if you are like, you're gonna to have to really work hard to lose most of the possible participation points. So again, chill out on that. Um, if you have some questions, not questions, sorry, if you have some feedback, if you have some feedback, if you want to talk to us about things, but uh, for some reason you don't feel comfortable broaching what you don't like about the class or how people are talking, and you don't want to say that directly to my face in an, or in an email, you're, which you are very welcome to do. I take criticism very well, and suggestions are always welcome. But if you want to do it anonymously, remember that there is a link to a Google form, which is completely anonymous. That link is here in the slide, and also you will see that it is in the syllabus. So please use it. All right, let us move along. So as I mentioned, we're after looking at ways to use data more efficiently for uh, the purposes of training. How can we know that we are, so both, can we make 
the limited amount of data that we've got work harder to get a better system? And how can we know that our trained algorithm does well on brand new versions of the same data? So that's the topic of today's machine learning pipeline discussion. And we will be using quite a lot of um, Jupyter here. Some of it just to kind of help you understand things, but also to show you examples of how to get the stuff done. Not the only ways to get the stuff done, but you know, whenever I have a lecture which is about this machine learning pipeline stuff, it's really always going to have a fair amount of uh, implementation in it. All right. So let me tell you a little story. Let's imagine that you have um, you have a hundred samples of patients' medical data. You have uh, you know the usual stuff: their weight and their age. You have blood measurements like triglycerides and blood glucose and other things. And what you're trying to do is predict their health status. Maybe there's a, uh, a metric of disease progression that you're trying to, to hit. Okay, So you want to look at things that are commonly collected and figure out if somebody might be sick and not know it kind of thing. Okay, So you have 100 patients, which is not bad for a, uh, a medical database kind of thing. Uh, but there are probably at least hundreds of thousands of people out there with this disease. Okay, Maybe everybody in America, you would love to collect their data so you could compare diseased and non-diseased individuals. So your ideal population is the 350 million plus people in America. And at the very least, you would love to have tens of thousands of samples. But no, you're stuck with 100. OK, so when you have limited data power, one of the things you may remember from stats class that you can do to try to understand better what's going on is various forms of resampling. And what we're going to talk to you to, about today is really just some form of clever resampling. And today we're going to be using it for figuring out how good your algorithm is in the sense of will it generalize? You've, you've got this population of 100. They're supposed to represent the 350 million plus Americans. So how can you know once your machine learning system, you've tested it, you have an idea of how good it is, you think, and you throw it out there in the world and it goes in a doctor's office and you know thousands of people start rolling through that doctor's office and using that machine. How well do you think it's going to do? Is it going to do as well as it did in training? Probably not. Probably there's going to be some features of your unique um, data set that you had, which are not going to be representative of 350 million Americans. So that's the question we're at, is how can we get a better idea of how good the algorithm is um, when it gets, sees new versions of the same kinds of data? We're going to talk just a briefly about the fact that you can do these same procedures to tune an algorithm to be as good as it can be. It's a topic of another lecture down the road here, but just the same kind of procedures are used also not just to figure out how good something is in generalization, but also uh, to twiddle the knobs to optimize the thing to be the best thing it can be. Now, there are many different procedures that work for this kind of stuff. Cross-validation is what we're going to mostly talk about today. It's a standard machine learning practice. But um, also interesting and relevant is bootstrapping, which does get used in machine learning, especially because it's designed around random forests. Um, but it's much more of a standard approach than cross-validation when you're in a statistics world. And there are other things as well, like these information criteria and so on and so forth, that are all used in ways to figure out how to set the knobs on things to the best possible way or to figure out a true estimate of something when you have small data. All right, so let's start with some intuition. What are we talking about here? Well, let's switch over to a Jupyter notebook. We're going to start in the world that we were at yesterday, uh, on, sorry, on Wednesday, where we were generating toy data. All right, let's see if this is all going to work out today. There we go. I think you can see that Jupyter Notebook. 
Let me switch over my control there. All right. So, like I said, we're just going to start with um, generating a sample from the same kind of linear algorithms that we were yesterday. Okay, we're going to generate a sample of size 10, just like yesterday, and I'm going to plot it. So what you see here as a reminder is that there is this green line, which is the true function generating this data. And from that true function, we are going to add on top random noise. And adding that random noise on top is what gives us these blue dots, which are the training data. Now, when you take those blue dots and shove it into an ordinary least squares linear regression, what you get out is the fitted red line there. So you can see that it doesn't exactly lie on top of the truth of the green line, but it's not far off. Now, remember that what we did is we drew a random sample of the noise. What would happen if we drew a different random sample? So previously, I just did this, and I set the random number generator to start off at this number. So if I want different behavior out of my random number generator, I can set a different number. Let's see what happens. So we're going to get a different random draw, a different roll of the dice. But everything else is the same underneath. Well, of course, as you would expect, we get lots more blue dots. They are different looking than the previous blue dots. And the line of regression, therefore, is a little different looking. Now, your intuition says if you keep doing this, because it's, you know, you have some statistical intuition. You keep drawing randomly, you keep rolling the dice, you know you're going to see slightly different things every single time. Okay? And that is indeed the case. Here's another seed, and here's another seed, and here's a last seed. Okay, they all look slightly different. There is some very, um, maybe significant variability here in the sense that the intercept changes, the slope changes, and... Um, it's never hugely off, but, I mean, they look different to your eyeball. Okay. What does this have to do with our 100 data points? Right? We have 100 people, and we want to know, can we use their data in such a way that we get a better idea of what is going to happen when we draw new thousands and thousands of people, right? So we, we train up on the data that's available, and they start walking through the doctor's office with the trained machine. What is our results going to look like? How bad are we going to perform? Well, let's take this, which has been, so far, it's just been about new random draws, right? That's not exactly what I was telling you happened. What we have is we have 100 data points. So instead of drawing new draws of 10 all the time from the underlying process, let's draw those 100 data points and let's look at random subsets of those data points. Okay, so your intuition says maybe if you draw a population and then resample that population, that things are going to look similar, but they're going to have some randomness, right? That it may have a flavor just like what we saw where every single regression is a little different. I'm gonna here I'm here to show you that your intuition is right. Okay? The whole point of doing this in Jupiter is just so you can really, you know, see it and feel it, live it. Okay? So we're gonna do that. We're going to generate right here 100 data points. Okay? They're coming from that same underlying function. And um, you can see the true function is still the same. Now, what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to subsample. We're going to take these 100 points. We're going to draw different folds, different subsamples of this data out. Okay? It's always going to be the same 100 points, but we're going to resample it. And right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it. So I'm going to do it without replacement. That means I'm drawing non-overlapping samples. So I'm going to take like this 10 and this 10 and this 10 
but a given data point is only going to go into one bucket. All right. So that's one way of doing this kind of sampling. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to, we have 100 data points here, so I have to get the numbers 1 to 100, and then I'm going to shuffle them into a random order. I'm going to use that as an index to resample the x and the y values both to be in this same random randomized order. Okay, so let's just take a look at that so you can know what I'm doing here. So here are the numbers uh, 1 to 100, or z actually 0 to 100, 0 to 99, something like that, right? And uh, we've reordered them, and we're going to draw the first 10 into one bucket, right? So these are 51 through 16, which is right here. And then we're going to do the second bucket and the third bucket. So we've randomized everything into these different buckets non-overlapping 10 buckets of 10. Okay, so here's 10 data points. Just like before, we're going to fit those regressions. Okay, each one of these graphs is a different bucket of data points. And once again, you see that same kind of variability that we were t seeing just a minute ago with new random draws from the same process. Okay, and quite a decent amount of variability by eyeball. All right, so what's, what maybe is not so apparent here is how much variability there was in all these red lines. So I'm gonna do the same buckets that we just did, right? I'm not gonna change anything in the shuffling. It's just gonna be the same setup. And I'm going to plot this time all those red lines on top of each other so that we can see the variability. So each fold, each subsample of the data, one-tenth of the total data, you fit the regression and you see quite a lot of variability in where those lines are. And again, underneath is that green line, which is the true process that has generated this data. Okay, well, that's pretty interesting. There's a wide amount of variability in those tenth of the sample right? So when you draw 10% of a sample, unsurprisingly, you can get quite a lot of difference sample to subsample to subsample. Okay, that's interesting. But what may not be apparent is when you squint at these red lines, that the average line in there, so to speak, is actually a pretty decent line. Let me show you. So what we're doing here is we are um, we're going to plot those same red lines, but I'm also going to get the mean uh, coefficients out of all this. So as we loop through those ten buckets, I'm collecting the data, the the predicted data coming out of the model, and the true uh, y values, and looking at um, sorry. I'm collecting is the coefficients. I'm ahead of myself here. So um, I'm collecting the coefficients. So we fit the model, right? And so the model pops out these coefficients. The, you know, this is y is equal to mx plus b, right? This is fitting the intercept of the line and the slope of the line. And so collecting those coefficients into an array and then at the end, we have 10 bias terms and we have 10 slope terms. And I take the mean of all of those and plot that mean line in cyan here in the light blue. Well, as you can see, that light blue line isn't bad compared to the green truth. Um, certainly, it looks a lot better than many of those red lines. So this is an interesting phenomenon that we have this great variability from fold to fold but we don't have the uh, we don't have much uh, as we don't have as much problem when we look at the average of all those lines, and this is an interesting thing which is going to crop up again and again for us. Okay, um, so let me stop there and head back into the slideshow. 
Okay, so this is what we all just saw. We can see that, in a sense, subsetting an existing sample acts a lot like more random draws. And we kind of, we would have intuited that, but it's nice to see it, okay? And we know that when we have subsamples or just samples at all, and resampling, right, that we're gonna get variability. And the more we resample, the more variability we're likely to see, especially because the nature of chopping up that 100 into non-overlapping sets is that the more we chop, the more folds we do, the more, the more we use. So like if we do a fifth of the data, right, we have 20 uh, samples in each fold, okay? But if we do, um, so if we, if we, sorry, we, yeah, I think I said that right. So if we, if we chop it up into fifths, we have 20 data points, right, in each fifth. If we chop it up into tenths, we have 10 data points. And the more we chop it up, the fewer data points we have. And so our fits get weaker and our ran the effect of randomness in the draw gets stronger and stronger. So we have, we have pulling things, things that are pulling against each other, right? The more we chop it up, the more variability there is in each chopped up part. But we also know that potentially when we have more things, they can vote, so to speak, with the mean. And, some, and in many cases, the mean of a lot of poor predictors is itself a better predictor than any one of the things in the ensemble. So we're going to learn about that at some point when we get to the ensemble learning part of this course towards the end. But all this turns out to really have um, kind of like a common basis in why this stuff keeps happening in machine learning. So I am not yet ready to take the deep dive into the math of the bias variance trade-off. At this point, even though I'm showing you an equation, I'm showing it to you only to develop a little bit more intuition about it. We're going to revisit this later. Um, but just so you know, this uh, formulation of it comes out of the Bishop textbook in chapter three. And fundamentally, what we're seeing here is that on the left hand side of this equation is the expected value of the loss function. What is that? right? The, the loss function is the thing we are trying to optimize. In the case of ordinary least squares, it was the residual sum of squares. And if you squint at this formulation here, you'll see that residual sum of squares format here inside. Okay, so this is the thing you're trying to make the best it can be to make your algorithm work. All right. And we are going to visit loss functions and all this stuff in greater detail in a, um, might even be next session, it might be two sessions from now. Sorry, my brain's a little scattered. Okay, but again, I'm just giving you a taste of things. So the left-hand side is the expected amount of loss we have when we're trying to make everything the best algorithm it can be. Now, when the algorithm is optimal, when it is its best version of itself, right, this is a constant value, it's not a variable. So that's very interesting, because that shows you if something on the left-hand side is a constant, then the right-hand side, which has two terms, is a trade-off. Every time one of these terms goes up, the other term has to go down. Aha! Uh -huh. And that is why this is called the bias-variance trade-off, because that term on the left is about how rigid is this thing, right? Is it always pushing for a certain interpretation of the data? So if you imagine um, that we, we, ignore, we want to ignore noise and reject noise and see the true underlying structure, something that pushes for everything's gotta be a line, it's always gotta be a line, is going to be much more rigid, have more bias than something that's like, oh, I'm perfectly happy to fit you know, any old wavy, wavy thing, that's going to have less bias. Something in the variance is, is similar to what we've already been discussing, right? 
the variability of different splits of the data can be formulated into this. All right, so again, this is an intuition check, not a math check. Don't worry if this is not making sense. We haven't covered, for instance, the notation of expectation. So yada, uh, just think about the fact that this is a trade-off and we're gonna talk more about it in future sessions. All right, so again, we can see high variance here when we chop up 100 data points into 20 different subsets with five samples each and fit those functions. There's a lot of variance, that's very clear, okay? Um, low variance is visible when we have the, uh, we chop it up into chunks of five, right? I'm sorry, into, into five chunks, which have 20 samples each. And you can see there's much less variability across those red lines. Now to really understand the bias thing, let's go back to this example from lecture three. If you remember at the end of lecture three, I took those generating functions, which are lines underneath, and I let other things try to fit them. In the top case, I was trying to fit a constant, a zeroth order polynomial, right? And when you look at that, what it's trying, what it's doing is it's it's got a lot of belief that this data has got to just be one single value, okay? And it turns out that when you formulate that with with a residual sum of squares, it always converges to the mean y value, okay? That's where that constant is, is the mean y value in the data set. So it strongly believes that this is all just a single value with noise around it without any kind of slope. It's, force, it's not a flexible algorithm, it has high bias, okay? This one down here has a ninth order polynomial so it can put all kinds of wiggles in its step and it can fit crazy, crazy curves. But because it's so flexible here, you know it's fitting noise because the only reason these blue dots are off the green line is because of noise. So it's clearly fitting noise here and not signal, okay? So it has very high variance and it's not pushing itself to be any particular shape. Okay, so this bias variance trade-off is going to arise multiple times when we talk about machine learning. Okay, step back to what we were talking about with the 100 data points, all right? So if you have 100 data points, you're in a situation where you have very limited data and you've gotta make the best of it. You can do something, you have to do something clever to manage your data to get the best fit and also likewise we have to uh, do something clever to get the uh, the best estimate of how good that is all right so the best fit we're going to kick down the road um, because that's the model selection thing but um, we're going to talk about generalization today and and how good you can get an estimate of how good something is okay so um, if you're on the left-hand side, if you're, you're in a tsunami of data, you don't have to be careful. And in fact, you generally don't wanna do some of the things we're gonna talk about like cross-validation because just fitting something with internet-sized data can take forever, let alone doing that refitting millions of times for a cross-validation. So let's start in the huge data set. <clears throat> if you have all the cat videos on the internet, and you are training a machine learning algorithm to recognize cat videos, then uh, you don't really have to do anything sophisticated, right? When statistics tells you that when your sample size is large, then it's a good approximation of the population. So when your test set is huge, whoops, when your test set is huge, then you can be sure that it's an accurate representation of all cat videos on the internet. So in that case, just randomly draw things and you will see that if you just take all your data you have available, put a chunk of it in the training set for making good algorithm and leave a big enough chunk in the test set that you feel comfortable that it's an accurate representation of the true population, right? Then your expected generalization performance is merely the test set performance because the test set is an accurate example of the population. Now, 
you're not going to use the training set performance here. Why is that? This uncomfortable silence is me actually making you ask yourself, why do you not use the training set? You in the back row. Yes, you are right. Because the algorithm has seen that training set data, it is likely to be better at it than data it hasn't seen, okay? The training set error, if you use the training set as a measure of your performance, that is likely to be a huge overestimate of how good you are when you see new data, okay? Algorithms especially, especially think of that ninth order polynomial, right? When algorithms are powerful, especially, your training set performance can be perfect easily, right? And when it is perfect, it's an indication that your algorithm is probably too powerful for the job because you know that there's noise underlying this whole setup, okay? But no matter what, it is fairly likely that your training set performance is going to be way better than you will get once you get those thousands of people coming to the doctor's office using your machine, okay? You're likely to make a lot more errors than you do on your training set in the doctor's office. So um, that's why we use a test set at all. We hold out some data, which the algorithm doesn't have a chance to overfit. And so assumedly, if the test set's a good uh, sample of our population, we're getting good estimation of generalization. All right, so maybe you have a fair amount of data, but uh, you, want to, you want to be more careful. You're not sure that it's an accurate representation of the, of the population. Well, you can do the technique that we were just showing, right? You can resample the data. You can resample the data k times and get k different training sets and k different test sets. Okay. If you do this with a shuffle split, what you're doing is you're sampling with replacement. So <clears throat> sometimes you get multiples of the same data point. Sometimes data points are here. Sometimes they're there. Sometimes Bob and George are together in the training set. Sometimes they're split up between training set and test set. Okay. Um, and in this case, the expected generalization performance is merely the mean of the test set performances. So when you have even, uh, actually, I have this wrong way around. <laughs> um, so uh, this, the cross-validation technique is when you have not enough data, right? But the shuffle split is getting towards the bootstrap, and that is, uh, that is way, a way you can maximize the performance of your data. But um, OK. So think of this as the, we have decent data, cross-validation, but not tiny, tiny data. And when we have tiny, tiny data, resampling with shuffle splits is maybe the best you can do. Maybe, it depends on the circumstance. <laughs> All right, but these are both techniques which are good for, we don't have internet-sized data. We don't feel comfortable that we have an, a population which accurately represents the whole of the, of the uh, population out there. All right. <clears throat> so getting back to cross-validation. Cross-validation is a technique where you take all the data and you split it up into different chunks, okay? You split it up into k equal folds. Um, so fold one, fold two, fold three, fold four, fold five, right there on the top of the, the gray boxes. So each one of those is one fifth of the data because we're giving an example here of five fold cross validation. We make five folds in the data, five subsamples. Points are in the fold one or they're in the fold two or they're in the fold three, but they're not in multiple folds. There is no replacement going on here. 
okay? So sampling without replacement, we evenly distribute the data between the folds in a random fashion. Now, what happens next is that we take four-fifths of the data, so the look at the split one there. Split one row, we take fold one and we hold it back, we hold it out, and we train on the other four-fifths of the data. And then we use our holdout set, fold one, to test. We get a we get a a a, uh, a measurement of how good the trained algorithm is on fold one, okay? So let's, let's ignore exactly what that measurement of how good it is is. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty in a bit, but we do that over and over again. We use the fold two as the holdout, training on the other four fifths, and then so on and so forth. Now, the special case of all this is when the number of folds is equal to the number of samples. In that case, you're only grabbing one of the 100 samples and you're training on the other 99. Now, the thing about the training on the other 99 is it maximizes the power of your data for training, okay? Um, there are use cases for this, especially when your data sets are very small, when you really need the power to uh, get the best possible training. However, as we know, found out earlier, the more folds you do, the higher the variability of this result. So you're gonna get crazy wacky results where when you hold out the first sample, the error is like millions, and when you hold out the second sample, the error is zero, okay? So you're gonna get that kind of thing. You're gonna get high variability from split to split of the training, okay? So just terminology, the folds are the fifths of the data, and the splits are the rows. There, first we train with holdout on fold one, and then we train with holdout on fold two. So splits are the sequence of training, and folds are the chunks of the data. All right? So, as I mentioned, as k increases, so does variance. So beware of k folds cross validation in the extreme cases of k. When you get lots and lots of splits, when you're in the leave one out zone, or even when you're in, you know, 50 fold validation, what you're saying is that you have, um, you're testing on just a 50th of the data. So if the data is small and a 50th of it is say two, you're gonna get a lot of variability from split to split. All right, so even though theoretically, as the variability gets bigger, the bias gets lower, right? Leave one out cross-validation is theoretically the most unbiased estimator of generalization. The problem is, is that um, that's only useful when variability doesn't swamp that signal, okay? Uh, when variability can rule the day, when there's enough of it that it causes a trouble, then you may actually not get a good estimate of generalization out of leave one out cross validation. So this is one of those modern rules of thumb that's kind of got hold in machine learning, right? Which is that generally one way, it's been shown that at least in some cases, or at least I should say in many cases, that doing repeated smaller folds is a better idea than doing large numbers of folds, okay? Because it minimizes the variance and still stays reasonably less biased. So what is this, what is this doing here, right? So we do the cross-validation, the five-fold cross-validation once, and then we reshuffle the data. So now we have different uh, folds, different, the, the data points are in different folds than they were before. It's still the same data points, but we reshuffle them in to be into different bins, okay? And we do that three times. And then our performance is then the average across all 15 folds of the data. But because we only split down to one fifth at a time of the data, then we end up with less variance. All right, so this is kind of a rule of thumb, but there, 
to be honest, to find the best way to do any given task requires an analysis, which we don't have the detail to go into yet here, okay? Um, and to be honest, many practitioners of machine learning probably don't bother to do an analysis to figure out which is the best way to split data, in part because many data sets are big enough you don't need to go crazy, right? And when they're small-ish, a couple of hundreds, a couple of thousands, then maybe, you know, it's not such a bad thing. You just kind of do three by five and it's mostly good enough, right? Um, but just wanted to let you know that the reason why people think three by five is a good thing is because there are analyses you can do to show that in these circumstances, this is the best way to do this job. Maybe something for you to get interested in in an advanced machine learning course. All right. So as I mentioned, we keep talking about this as what we can do to get a better idea of the generalization. There are ways to use this to do model selection and feature selection. That is, to twiddle the knobs on the setup to get the best algorithm possible, okay? So we can do, um, so instead of just doing training set and test set, if we split off a third set for validation, then what you do is you train on this and then you check how good you are in the validation set. And you do this repeatedly again and again and again as I twiddle the knobs and change the hyperparameters of my model or try different machine learning algorithms, or try different features of the data, transformations of the data, to best get the, the, the best performance out of my system. So you do that again and again, like a training test cycle, but you're doing it to make the model better. And then once you have your best model, and then you wanna check about generalization with your best model, then you take your best model to the test set, okay? So um, we will cover this more, but right now that's as far as I want to go in model selection. Just to let you know, what we're doing is one use of the pipeline uh, of data splitting. We can, we can use it for other things too. All right, so uh, Let's get our hands dirty with a little bit of scikit-learn. So I'm just gonna show you how to do things like train test split and k-folds. There are functions and they have kind of a uniform sort of uh, API as always in a nice software package. So let me switch us out here. So this time, let's take a look at a 50, a sample size of 50. So our training set is going to be 50 dots. And um, what we want to do is we want to split them into training and test set, okay? So this is as before. We're going to draw 50 from the toy function. And this is the new thing. This is a, a scikit-learn function. And what you do is you pass it all of your data, the X's and the Y's, the inputs and the desired labels or you know desired outputs. And one way you can use it is to say, I would like my test set to be one third of my data. Okay, so if I do that and plot, then you can see that we've split up the data into blue training set and yellow test set. And the assignments, the split up is done completely randomly. Okay, we haven't done anything with it yet. We've just split it into train and test. Well, let's, uh, let's fit our polynomial features, okay? So we're gonna fit the features. And once we get the polynomial features out of the training and the test set here, then we're going to fit the data we're going to fit the training set, of course. And then we're going to run the model forward on the training data. Well, that's interesting. Why are we running the model on the training data? We've already trained on it. Well, I want to get a measurement of training set performance. I want to know how good is my model on the data that it got trained on, OK? So we can do that by, in this case, taking the mean squared error between 
the predicted line. Essentially, that's the line of regression. That's going to be the red line, okay? The predicted value is where the regression line lies. We're going to take the difference between that and the desired y values, right? And in fact, you may recognize this as the residual, right? The residual sum of squares that we use to train OLS is highly related to the mean squared error. Okay, the residual sum of squares is we take the residual and we square it and we sum it all together. The mean squared error is we do exactly that, same deal, but then we divide it by the number of samples. Okay, and root mean square is then we put the square root on top of it, right? So those are, the mean squared error is just Instead of stopping at the summing part, we make it a mean. We divide by the number of samples, okay? But it's highly related to the same thing that we're actually trying to optimize with OLS. All right, so let's take a look here. So here we go. Here are our blue dots from the graph above, okay? So here are the blue dots again, same dots. You can see the fitted line is in red, and it's quite tight to the truth. You can see that with how close the red line is to the green line. And you can also see it in a different way here. You can see it in terms of this measurement of the training set error, right? If you saw those blue dots were much further away from the red line on average, then this number is going to get higher because the residuals are higher, right? And if those blue dots were lying almost right on top of the line, this number would start to get close to zero. All right, so what about the test set error? We've already trained this guy up. Let's go ahead and just run it forward on the test set, data that it's never seen before, right? So we're gonna do that. Here are those yellow dots. We're plotting only the test set. We're plotting the red line, which was trained on the training set, right? It has nothing to do with these yellow dots. And we can see that the distance that the red line is away from the yellow dots is going to uh, be reflected in the test set error, in the difference between the prediction moving forward from this train model and the true y values in the test set. Okay? Well, looking at this number, it's quite a lot higher than the training set error. And as I said, if you imagine that your test set is an accurate prediction of how well you're going to generalize to brand new data to the thousands of people walking into the doctor's office to use your machine, right? Then uh, you can see that the training set error, like I promised, is a pretty bad underestimate, potentially, of the true error. Okay. Well, this is a toy problem, so it's not really hard to obtain medical data, we can just draw as many data points as we want from the process again. We can actually get brand new data, 10,000 points, and see how much it gener how our generalization is doing, okay? Let's do that. So we draw 10,000 new points from the, the underlying process, and what we're seeing is the true generalization error is 0.25. So it's between these two things, between training set and test set, but as promised, the real deal is that the training set underestimates the problem, okay? So nobody cares what your training set error is. Your training set error can often be zero, and it means nothing about how good your algorithm is. Always be looking for somebody making the mistake of reporting training set error. All right. Well, let's do this with k-folds. Now, k-folds, um, remember what we're doing is we're splitting it up into, in this case, five chunks of non-overlapping bins. So we put data in one of these bins, not in, not in multiple bins. Each data point goes in one. And we're going to repeatedly fit the model. We're gonna fit the model on four-fifths of the data, check it on the holdout, and we're gonna put the predictions of the holdout data into an array and we're going to accumulate all those predictions into one long array from all five splits. And then we're going to check 
the array of predicted values against the true y values that were in the holdout. So we're going to take the mean squared error over all of those splits. And what we get is a number like 0.23, which is quite a lot closer to the true generalization error of this. OK, so that's all I had for you guys today. I hope that you have a uh, good rest of your day, and I look forward to chatting with you more in the coming lectures and office hours. Bye.